Okay, my story starts with a simple fact. I was a Cub Scout. I was a Cub Scout because the kid who lived four doors down from the house I'd just moved into asked if I wanted to come along. I said, sure, why not? Now, as a Cub Scout, I was encouraged to do a good deed every day, to help someone out, my mum, an old lady crossing the road, whatever. I didn't mind, as long as I got to keep crashing my bike into things, I was happy. When I got to high school, I was still in Scouts and I did some other stuff. I helped out with Clean Up Australia Day. And I used to put my hand up at school when they were asking for volunteers to sell uh, badges for charity at a train station because it meant we got a few hours off school. Sounded like a good deal to me. By the time I got to uni, I was getting involved in everything. I'd help some of my dorm mates with their studying and assignments. I, I helped organise Men's Week, which raised awareness of men's health issues. I also tried to help out with Women's Week, but that didn't have the effect I was hoping for when I signed up. So, by the time I was 21, I was six months out from completing a four-year, $20,000 university degree. And I had a moment. I realised I'd become addicted. You see, I'd always kind of enjoyed helping people, and I generally had fun doing it. But somewhere along the line, something had changed, and it was no longer just an option for me. I'd see something was wrong, and I'd start trying to fix it. Not because I felt I had to, or because I ought to, but because I could imagine something better, and I wouldn't be happy until I'd done something to help. And bit by bit, even though it wasn't anything I ever set out to do, with each experience of, of helping people and trying to change things, I'd want to do more. And so at this moment, I realised I'd become addicted. And it changed the course of my life. I, I started to care more about national and then global issues. I volunteered to go work overseas in Bougainville, which it turns out is a place in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> I came back to Australia and I, I, I read more and I learnt more and I became absolutely passionate about wanting to change the world. Now you've probably experienced something like this. When you're passionate about something, you can't understand why other people aren't. It simply didn't make sense to me that other people didn't get why we needed to change the world. It was all I could think about and it was all I thought anyone else needed to hear. I believed in human rights and social justice and the need to care for the environment. And I, I kept meeting these people, good people, but people who just didn't get it. And I was convinced that if I could just explain it a little better, make it a little clearer, that the penny would drop and that would change everything. But I've come to realise that that's not the way the world works. And that's not the way people work. And despite our successes, we ha really haven't convinced people that we need to change the world. Progress comes in excruciatingly small increments and as we know on some issues, that's not good enough. How many of you think we need to make some pretty significant changes in this world? Well, I do believe we need to change the world, but the telling people why isn't going to get the job done. So I'm going to tell you three things that we, so it's you, me, and every person or organisation that wants to make this a reality, three things that we need to do to change the world. And when I say change the world, I'm not talking about one thing or one issue or one event. I'm talking about how we're going to achieve that real, long-term, sustainable change that so many of us are after. Whether you care about climate change or global poverty, human rights, gender equality or all of the above, you've probably recognised that the problems we face in this world are not small, they're enormous and complex and then the solutions don't lie in a small adjustment or a minor tweak of the world as it is. The significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. What we need is a fundamental shift in the way we think and act as human beings. A revolution. Not in terms of overthrowing governments, although looking at this audience I suspect you've all had the urge from time to time. But rather a change in the world, like that brought on by the Renaissance or the Industrial Revolution or the electronic and information age we're in now. What we need, if we're going to address not just one but all of the problems at the local national and global levels, what we need is an entire generation that cares about the world and what happens in it and that will actually act to change it for the better. Now what I'm talking about is called in academic circles active citizenship, but I'm not going to use that term because it doesn't work for most people. What we're talking about is caring about the world and doing something about it. And I don't just mean some people, I mean everyone. 
an entire generation because that's what it's going to take. We need our politicians, our journalists, CEOs, shareholders, teachers, students, even lawyers to get it. All right? We need the, all these people to do their jobs and to live their lives, but to do it in a way that makes things just a little bit better. We need them all to care and we need them all to act. That's how we're going to change the world. And it requires a very different approach. The way we tend to operate now is we try to get X number of people to take Y action, whatever it might be, change a light bulb, sign a petition, write a letter. And if that's what you're aiming to do, you start with the people who most agree with you already and then you work your way out from there until you reach that number X. But if you're going after an entire generation, you need a very different approach. You need to appeal to everyone. Now some people would say you can't appeal to everyone and in a way they'd be right. There is no one way you can talk about labour rights, for example, that will appeal to everyone. Because everybody's different and everybody sees things in different ways. What you can do is ask a question. The first thing we need to do is to stop talking at people and start asking questions. How many of you think that climate change is the biggest issue we face right now? How many think it's human rights? How many think it's something else? When we talk at people, we define the conversation. And if it doesn't appeal to them, they won't engage. When we ask a question, we allow more options. We allow the person we're communicating with to shape the conversation. And obviously, the more open the question, the more scope there is for it to become personally relevant to whoever's answering. That's an important point. If my question is specific to human rights or climate change, I'm still putting up boundaries that limit your options. The way we ask our questions is important. We need to meet people where they're at and ask open questions in places and ways they can connect with. Asking uh, issue-specific questions at social justice events and political forums is a slightly advanced form of preaching to the converted. So this is what we've been doing with three things. We ask questions. We do it in a simple, fun and easygoing way. We ask questions like, what are three things you can do to change the world? We're not asking people to lay out an action agenda for world peace. We're just planting a seed, getting them thinking. And this is how we can start a conversation. And with that conversation, we can help them to explore important ideas and issues on their own terms. Different people respond to different issues in different ways. Some people are passionate about the environment. Some people are passionate about MasterChef. And that's fine. You know, but if we want people to appreciate that a particular issue is important at a personal level, we need to help them come to that realisation on their own terms. Now, in a previous life, I was an outdoor education instructor. I'd take groups of school kids hiking in the bush and I would tell them very clearly that it's absolutely essential you regularly check your map when you're hiking. And they would nod and say, yes, of course we will check our map when we're hiking. And then we'd start walking and they'd be talking and looking at things and telling jokes. And before long, we've walked two hours in the completely wrong direction down a great big long hill with our heavy packs. And then they'd come to a creek or a river that wasn't supposed to be there and the penny would drop. They'd look back up the big long hill, down at the heavy packs on the ground and then back at me. And I always knew by the look on their faces that that was the point at which the message got through. <laughs> it didn't matter how often I told them or how clear I was because there are some things you can't tell people. There are some things you need to learn through your own experience and your own exploration. And that is why a question is so much more powerful than a lecture. Because it forces us to think for ourselves, to explore an idea and its consequences. That's how we learn best and that's how we really start to get it. So the first thing we need to do is to ask a question. The second thing we need to do is to support people to take action. We need to help them connect the dots from, I care about this, to I want to see this changed, to I'm going to do something to help create that change. And again, this is typically called empowerment, but what we're really talking about is a mind shift, or rather a shift in mind shift, a shift in mind. We need to support people to take action themselves, to create change themselves. And in doing that, we'll breed confidence and the idea that if I 
don't like something, I can change it. And that's a really significant shift for a lot of people. The idea that one person can't make a difference, that our problems are too big or too hard, has become mainstream. But with this shift in mindset, we get a very different view of the world. There are no inevitabilities, I'm not powerless, and if I don't like something, I can change it. Now, the key here is to focus on process. I'll come back to him in a sec. Focus on process. Now, contrary to what a, few, a lot of people believe, there isn't just one or two ways to create change. There's all sorts of different ways, and people can do it in a way that fits best with their life and their skills and capacity. These guys are a great example. Luke's, uh, Luke Slattery and Travis Garone were a couple of guys sitting in a pub. And they thought, wouldn't it be great if guys brought back moustaches? They thought, what, if we're going to do this, why not do it for a cause? So they got together a group of 30 friends, they all grew a moustache, and Movember was born. Now, Movember raises awareness of men's health issues and more than $20 million a year. It's gone global. And earlier this month, a Perth man became the their one millionth registration for Movember. It started with two guys in a pub who decided to do something. This guy's a friend of mine, Michael Brasowski. I first met Michael in Vietnam. He'd gone to Vietnam to become an English teacher at a university. And while he was there, he started chatting to some street kids, shoe shine boys. Now, these kids had a tough life, and Michael realised that learning to speak English would be a really strong asset in a tourist town like Hanoi. So he teamed up with one of his local students and they started teaching the kids English and then a little bit of maths and then they did some art and then they started playing soccer and Michael could see that he was having an impact. He wanted to do more so classes became food, food became shelter, shelter became medical support. Michael gave up his job at the university and set up the Blue Dragon Children's Foundation which has literally changed the lives of thousands of young kids. It started because Michael decided to teach some kids some English. This guy, Daryl Nichols from Bondi in Sydney. Daryl cared about sustainability and was sick and tired of seeing people throw their old junk on the side of the road around the suburb. He figured people would much rather sell their stuff than throw it away into landfill. So he teamed up with the local council to organise the Garage Sale Trail, a community event where people all around Bondi have garage sales on the same thing, on the same day. More than 120 people the first time round. And a whole lot of some people's trash became a whole lot of other people's treasure. And it started with Daryl decide, caring about people dumping their stuff. See, there's no, there's no rule book to this. There's, it's whatever works for you. People can and do create change in hundreds of different ways. And we should be encouraging people to do whatever works best and fits with their life and their issues and their skills. Whether it's growing a moustache or teaching English or organising garage sale, all these things help to create change. They all have an impact. And what usually starts with one or two, pe one or two people grows as they get more people involved. It snowballs to have an even bigger effect. Our job is to help get them started. But there is a catch, and the catch is that we don't get to choose what other people care about. We don't get to choose what they take action on. Okay? I can talk about my issues all I want. I can lay out the facts and tell people simple solutions and what they can do to change, but real action comes from within. Real passion, real motivation is not something you can tell people, no matter how right you are or how loud you yell. The drive to go from sitting on the couch to changing the world must come with, from within. And that means I don't get to choose what you care about. Okay, so we need to help people to choose their own things. We can, we can create an entire generation that will care and will act, but we can't do it if we're only willing to help them when they're acting on our issues. If we work with these people, if we help them to realise that they can create change, they will take on the challenges that we face in this world, like climate change and global poverty and so on, and they will do it in a way 
that far exceeds our own expectations, that far exceeds our own best efforts so far. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead said that, and she was right. The problem is we've got literally millions, billions of people who don't believe they can change anything. We've helped to create that belief, and we can help to change it. And that brings us to our third thing. We need to spread the word, or better put, we need to help other people spread the word. We need to help people share their stories of taking action, of success and challenges, and of the impact they've had. And this will inspire other people to do the same. Change can go viral. We are more connected now than at any point in human history. And we, as groups and individuals, we can learn more, do more, and share more. Okay, the ideas that are worth spreading are spreading. And a young person in Perth can read about, see and be inspired by a young person in Sydney or Jakarta, in Cape Town or Bogota. But this generation of young people in particular gets its information and news peer to peer. Okay, so if we want this idea to spread, if we want the belief that anyone can take action to change the world to become contagious, we need to make young people our storytellers, our early adopters. We need to make young people our leaders. We need to provide the platforms and support to help young people inspire other young people. Now Oxfam does this with our international youth partnerships. They're meeting right now in New Delhi, 300 young people from 98 countries, all of whom are doing their own amazing things to create change in their own communities. And they're sharing their stories and ideas and learning from each other's experiences. Young people inspiring other young people. That's how you start to have an even bigger impact. That's how you get a multiplier effect. We need to create our own tipping point where the few become the many. The point at where taking action, whatever it might look like, becomes an all pervasive meme and changing the world becomes the new black. See, I believe that people can change, both themselves and the world. This is the generation that is going to change the world and the course of human history. But it's not going to happen by getting everyone to do the same thing and to act in the same way and to care about the same issues. It's going to happen by supporting people and encouraging them to care about the world and to take action in their own lives to create a, a better change. It's going to happen one person at a time. It's going to happen one action at a time. And it's going to start with you. So I'm going to finish with a question, or rather three questions. Three things for you to think about. What do you care about? What do you want to see changed? And what are you going to do about it? Thank you.